So I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. We have kind of a fun session planned, so a good way to ease back in after lunch. Um, I'm going to be talking about designing for the future and uh, just kind of sharing what's next in a couple different uh, disciplines that we're all very interested in. It's crazy how fast things change. Um, so let's fast forward to 2017. I think you guys will all um, recognize some of the products on this infographic, but this is the state of marketing technology in 2017. So, you know, starting from the 90s when you had an option to join internet to this, um, that's a lot of changes fast, and it can be kind of dizzying to keep up with that. So, you know, to participate in marketing technology today, you almost need to be a little bit of a unicorn, or in my case, a catacorn. I'm going to walk over here so they can get a photo of me so that next time I speak at a conference, this is my photo. <laughs> you got to know what you're getting when you have me speak. Um, so to, to be a marketing technologist today or to be in any type of related field, you really need to be equally adept at technology, design, and UX. And almost more importantly than that, you need to kind of understand those blurred spaces in between. So as a designer, I wanted to fix this slide. I think this more accurately represents kind of the space that we're all in right now. And so today for my talk, I'm going to look at each one of these territories, and we're going to look at artificial intelligence, design systems, and something really cool called progressive web apps. So let's get started with AI. Um, you know, up until kind of recently, this is obviously a buzzword now, but before that, our main kind of frame around artificial intelligence is what we saw in the movies. So you might think of the Terminator um, to, you know, have a good throwback. More recently, who's seen the movie Her, where a man falls in love with his operating system? Um, and if you need something to tide you over um, between now and when Game of Thrones comes back, I recommend checking out HBO's Westworld. It's about this, um, this camp where it's a kind of a blend of human um, tourists and robot hosts. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and of course, there's, you know, in 2010, we, we met IBM Watson, IBM's supercomputer that ended up winning on Jeopardy. Uh, and at the time, they were kind of one of the only ones uh, with a household name of an AI program. And now, of course, that's not the case anymore. You've got um, Salesforce, Einstein, Adobe Sensei, some of these other ones up here. I think in the last couple of years, Google has bought or acquired 12 different AI companies. Apple has acquired eight. Um, so we're just seeing a lot of activity in this space. And you might have also heard um, recently Facebook's AI program, FAIR, was in the news. Um, did anyone hear about this? It was really, really overhyped. So we'll look at some of those articles that you may have seen. I love the one, you know, Facebook engineers panic. They pull the plug on AI after bots develop their own language. Uh, this one uh, in the bottom right, they actually use like a humanoid, you know, robot form. Of course, that's not what Facebook was actually using, but if you put two computers next to each other, that probably doesn't get the same amount of clicks. So I was curious, you know, my husband actually even mentioned um, this, these articles to me. And so I did a little bit of digging. I went to trustysnopes.com. Hopefully everybody here knows about Snopes. Um, it's a great place to kind of fact check any of those weird email forwards you get from family members. Um, and of course, you know, did Facebook shut down an AI experiment because chatbots developed their own language? No, that's not what happened. What actually happened was, um, so the whole point of this study was to improve communication between humans and AI. And they forgot to program um, the bots to just use English. So they started to use gibberish, and it, it was just not useful. So they had to recalibrate, reprogram them, and carry on. So they didn't shut it down, and they certainly didn't shut it down because of, um, you know, the robots became self-aware and were communicating. So take it all with a grain of salt. Um, so there's a lot of hype around it, but there's a, a lot of promise, especially for everybody in this room. There's um, tremendous um, value in, in learning how AI can help your marketing efforts. And so, um, so we're going to look at a couple different ways that that might apply to your everyday life. Um, so who here has already worked with AI? So everybody's hand should be raised because we all work with AI on a daily basis. Things like Uber's, you know, time to your destination, Facebook's kind of creepy photo recognition software, um, credit card detection fraud, um, even, you know, virtual assistants like Siri. Those all use some form of AI. You just might not think of it that way. And so I think a good kind of representation um, or definition of what AI is, is very simple. Artificial intelligence is simply a better way to turn data into actionable insights. So just kind of think about it in that way. Another good mental model um, is this continuum, so this machine learning continuum. And this is kind of how I'm going to break down the next couple minutes of my talk. So we're going to look at um, systems that kind of run the gamut. So starting with systems that act, this is kind of the boring one, so I'll skip over that. 
Um, and then the really interesting stuff starts to happen here. So systems that predict, systems that learn, and systems that create. And then kind of get into creepy territory with systems that evolve. So we won't spend too much time on that. So systems that act. You can think of this in very simple terms. These are rule-based machine learning programs, something like cruise control um, or the fire alarm in your house. You know, if this happens, then that happens. So like I said, that's boring. So we'll go on to the cooler stuff. Um, so systems that predict. Uh, this is my Amazon Prime uh, page. This is what Amazon recommends for me. If you know me, this tracks. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever seen one of my talks, you probably assume I have multiple cats at home. True. Um, if you've ever gone to the cocktail hour with me, you know that I like wine. And if you've ever talked to me, you know that I'm a big fan of the Sophie the Giraffe anthology. So uh, next up, this is where it starts to get really cool, systems that learn. I'm not going to talk too much about bots because Vinu, I don't want to steal his thunder. He's going to talk about all the um, you know, natural language processing and kind of the cool technical stuff that powers it. Um, but just bots in general, these are things that can learn. They can get better as they get more data. And so I thought this was a cool stat, that um, of the businesses surveyed, 80% said they wanted chatbots by the year 2020. So that's pretty significant. Does anybody here have a chatbot? No? OK. Well, pay attention. Um, so we're going to look at two examples from Quartz. Quartz is a really cool news publishing um, you know, platform, and they, they aggregate a lot of content. Um, so the first one is actually not that new of an example. This is their app, and I give credit to Sarah Meyer for showing everybody at One North this very cool app. Um, and they designed something called a conversational inter interface. This was a, a buzzword about a year or two ago. So I'm going to show you a little video of how that works. You download the Quartz app, and rather than launching a traditional app screen, it starts a texting conversation with you. You can see when the system is thinking. You get the little, um, oh there, you get the little, you know, three dots. They actually use emojis to help you filter content and decide what to see next. So it feels very, very natural, um, and it's just a very memorable experience. And so I wasn't surprised because, you know, Quartz was kind of ahead of the curve on that when they introduced Hugo this year. So Hugo is a bot designed to connect you with the most recent tech news. So think about using something like this for one of your industry groups um, or client alerts. I mean, this could be a very practical application for you. And so you can kind of see, you know, it starts the conversation, it starts to filter, it starts to learn what I'm interested in, and then, you know, it starts to deliver news that might be relevant to me. So it's interesting, I you know, had gone to the Hugo site um, a couple weeks ago to prepare for this talk, and then I went back to Quartz recently, and I saw this ad. So they're actually advertising, you're in luck, our tech bot now knows even more. So they're advertising that this is a system that learns, um, which I thought was really cool. All right, so here it starts to get a little bit wild. Now we're going to talk about systems that create. So you might wonder, what do Google, the Beatles, and Nutella have in common? Well, all three of these are examples of companies that have leveraged uh, AI programs that help create something. So we'll take a look at three examples here. These are paintings from Google's uh, deep learning neural network program. So these are not created by humans. They are created entirely by AI. They actually sold, one of them sold for $84,000 at a recent art auction. So it's kind of just interesting how, um, you know, how art is uh, starting to use uh, modern technologies like AI. Next, we're going to look at a song by the Beatles. There should be audio here. So if that song didn't sound familiar to you, you're not alone. That song was entirely created by a Sony AI system. So it looked at all the different songs in the Beatles you know, canon and kind of created this new song that creepily sounds like them. So that's pretty amazing. So my third example for a system that creates is Nutella. Uh, not only a delicious chocolate hazelnut spread, but a technology company. So they used AI to create 8 million different labels. So at, you know, during this campaign, you could go to the grocery store, buy a jar of Nutella, and you could go home being confident that you had one individual label that nobody else had um, that was created by AI. So pretty cool examples. So now we start to get into the VR, AR space. Um, certainly a, a way to use AI to, to create something out of nothing or thin air. I think one of the first examples that I can remember was the 2008 election night. I mean, it fe felt a little corny at the time, but CNN had holograms on their you know, election coverage. A couple years later, Coachella used a hologram to bring Tupac back to life. Those are kind of fun examples. Um, 
And then Pokemon Go, this was a big craze. I'm sure some of you participated in it. Um, you know, everybody walking around with their phone with this augmented reality app. Um, it's kind of when it really became mainstream. Um, another one that I like to play with are those Snapchat filters where you, you, know, you can put a crown on your head or do crazy things. Um, they had one recently where you could take two pictures in your phone and they'd kind of merge. So I really want to thank Kalev for helping me with the next part of my presentation. And Dawn, I'm sorry about the next part of my presentation. <laughs> Because this is what happens. I present Dolov. <laughs> so this is fun, right? I mean, if you know Kalev or Dawn, you see both of them in this. Um, <laughs> but what might an actual application of this be? None of these people are real. So all of these were created from an AI system that it goes through and it takes different celebrity photos. So if you look really hard at this, you can probably see, you know, somebody's eyes and somebody's nose, um, but they look pretty real, which is a little bit scary, especially when you think about you know, fake Twitter bots and things like that. Um, but, but that's kind of you know, where that technology from Snapchat, Snapchat continues to, um, to grow. So finally, systems that evolve, um, we're not there yet. You know, that is really the stuff of um, sci-fi movies. Thank you for the chuckles from Arrested Development fans. Uh, but you know that that's that's kind of a territory that we're not there yet. So, just to review, you know, systems that act—that's not a really surprise to anybody. We've all been working with systems like that for a long time. It's really in the middle. Um, systems that predict, learn, and create—that's kind of where the magic is right now, and where it's really exciting. So, 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 what does this mean for us? I mean, what this means is, uh, you know, they're not going to take over our jobs, but our jobs are going to change. So, as a result. We're going to see our role shift more from creator to curator. So, you know, a machine might be able to, you know, pump out um, a thousand lines of ad copy, and then you would have to go through and, and curate those. And so, you know, what this will do is it will free us up, and it will allow us more time to solve problems that require human intelligence to solve. So, it will amplify our ability to explore, experiment, and refine. All right, so ideas for you guys. Um, here are real ideas that you can use AI in your everyday um, marketing, marketing jobs. So enhanced search experiences. We're already starting to see some of this on, on B2C sites, um, and I think this is something that could really, in the very near future, um, become a reality for everybody in this room. Consider a conversational UI for frequently asked questions. You know, I was talking with somebody at breakfast this morning, and they said, yeah, I get like 10 emails a day. Where's the PowerPoint template? Um, it's probably on an internet and you probably sent an email that nobody read. So wouldn't it be great if there could be an internal bot that could solve, you know, 90% of those questions that people bug you about every day? I see a lot of head nodding. Um, you know, like the Hugo example, consider a bot for thought leadership. You know, maybe it's some type of industry or client alert um, that could provide real value to your clients. And then we, we do have some clients that are um, kind of dipping their toe into the water of personalization and recommendations. That can happen right on your website um, or in email campaigns, but there's a lot of different applications of that. So that's kind of what I see on the horizon for artificial intelligence. Next, as a designer, I'm very passionate about this section, we're going to talk about design systems. So design systems, um, there's a lot of different words out there. If you read about it, you might read about you know, atomic design, design language, pattern library, design style guide, design standards. They all kind of mean the same thing. And it's just the, a modern 2017 way to document your brand. So if you think about how we used to document brands, this is, um, you know, graphic designers, this is kind of a cool thing to have. I think Ryan Schulz has this in his office. It's the NASA brand guidelines. Um, and I get it. If you're putting a logo on the side of a rocket ship, you probably don't want that to change. Um, and so, you know, what used to happen is you used to go through this brand exercise, you'd get this brand book, you'd print it out, you'd put it on everyone's desks. Um, there still might be a place for that, but you need to consider a way to more quickly um, evolve your brand as technology changes and your, your brand presence changes. So what we're seeing now are all these different devices, all these different channels, all these different touch points that users have with your brand. And so we need a way to document for consistency um, so that you're able to react quicker. So um, in this age of diversity, we really need to focus more on patterns than discrete pages. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. So patterns, I consider you know, reusable bits of design and content that you then can stitch together into responsive design systems. A really good way to think about this is um, Brad Frost's atomic design kind of philosophy. Um, he's a web developer, designer, thought leader in the space, and he broke it down like this. 
So first you have atoms in your design system. Think about that as a button or a link. And then you can make a molecule by stitching a couple different atoms together. And then you make an organism from stitching multiple molecules together, and you kind of get the idea. Here's a little GIF. You can see on the bottom, this is an atom, this is a molecule, this is an organism, this is a template, and then you get into the full web page. So just kind of a different way to think about designing. And to be honest with you, this is how we have been thinking about design. This is how we code, um, at least on the front end side. And this is something we've been doing, but now I'm seeing more clients, um, especially in the B2C space, start to document in this manner. So you might think, well, won't that get boring if we have the same button everywhere, if we have the same element everywhere, you know, where's the creativity in that? And so I'll challenge that with a familiar metaphor. Legos. So it's actually interesting. Legos haven't changed in, I don't know, 50 years. I mean, it, they have been around a long time. Those building blocks have not changed. And if you're a creative-minded person, you can do a lot of really cool things. Have you guys ever seen those Lego sculptures where people do the Taj Mahal? Um, so I found a couple, just to prove my point, that just because you have consistent building blocks, the sky's the limit as far as creativity goes. Um, I also kind of, I found this ad campaign that Lego did a couple years ago, and I thought this was also a great example. What they did was they took all their one-piece Legos and recreated famous works of art. So, I mean, this is kind of a cool study of Gestalt. You can kind of squint your eyes. You're all going to recognize these are uh, works of art. So this is the Mona Lisa. This is Girl with a Pearl Earring, American Gothic, and Van Gogh's self-portrait. So by just using one pixel Legos, they could recreate famous works of art. So there's really no excuse. Just because you um, have consistent design applications doesn't mean that limits your creativity. Now that's not to say you can't get lazy with it, and I'm not gonna spend too much time making fun of a 12-year-old, but come on, Riley, a worm. <laughs> <laughs> Riley is either a minimalist genius or totally forgot about this assignment and turned it in at the last minute. <laughs> um, so with design systems, we think about this you know, interplay between consistency and creativity. When should I be creative? When should I be consistent? And I think this is kind of a good mental model around that. So, you want to really be creative, creative and, and, you know, sky is the limit when you're thinking about those atoms and those molecules. And then as you start to, um, you know, get them into organisms, templates and pages, that's when you need to be more thoughtful and consistent. And designing your, your brand system this way will allow you to have visual interests but an intuitive user experience. And that's what we're all, kind of all hoping for. So you want to be consistent, but you don't have to be completely uniform. And I think that's kind of a good way to think about this. All right, so now we're gonna look at a, some cool examples, um, hopefully inspirational for you guys. The first is Airbnb. Now the cool part about this, this is all online. I think it's design.airbnb.com or airbnb.design, um, but they've put this out there, so anybody can go take a look at it. So I'm gonna walk you through their system. So Airbnb, this is, you know, this is pretty expected. This is probably most of you have a brand document that looks like this. We go through their typography system, through their color palette, through some spacing, um, you know, grid systems, pretty normal stuff. Then you start to look at different content components. Then you start to look at how those components can build templates and pages together. And I think one of the interesting parts about Airbnb's design system is that they had to design a system or a framework that relied on a lot of content that they didn't have control over. So text, photos, I think everybody in this room can kind of you know, sympathize with that. You don't know what photo is gonna be uploaded here. You don't know what news you know, logo you need to put here. And so they were able to create this system and by thoroughly documenting it, ensure that the brand experience was consistent, even though they didn't have control over everything. Um, and so then you start to see, you know, if you've ever encountered their app or their website, you, you definitely know Airbnb's design when you encounter it. Um, one of my favorite parts uh, about Airbnb's system is they have added animation to it. So as you start to think about how to make your brand digital, Animation should play a role in it. You should define animation principles. You can de define speeds um, of transitions and things like that. Airbnb felt so strongly about this, they actually created their own animation library and they, they put it up. It's open source. We've actually, you know, our developers have played around with it. Um, so don't forget about things like motion and animation when you're defining these brand, uh, these design systems. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pause and explain this next part before I show the video because it is really cool. Um, as I was researching this talk, you know, I'd been looking up a lot of articles on artificial intelligence and things like that, and so, um, so Twitter was recommending this new, you know, uh, article by Airbnb, so I clicked on it. 
and it's um, it's an article about invisible design, and it's how the Airbnb design and technology teams are leveraging both AI and design systems to rapidly prototype. And so what that means is if you look in the you know, top right, the first sketch is something that a, a team member drew out. And then you can see the system start to abstract it. And then below that in the kind of gray box, um, what the system is doing is it's identifying known components. So you know, this is where an image goes. This is where a piece of content goes. And because they had so thoroughly documented their design system and then had front-end developers code it, the system, without needing a developer, can take a sketch and turn it into a piece of code. So let me, I'll walk you, th I'll play the video now that I've kind of explained it. So you see the sketch get scanned in. Then you see the computer, the code start running. And then it changes out that content on the left side. That's pretty wild that you don't need a developer um, to do something like this if you want to rapidly prototype. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need a developer. What that means is you don't need a developer to do the same thing 10 times in a row. So it frees them up to focus on something like performance or accessibility. Um, it focuses designers, you know, allows designers more room um, to focus on other, you know, larger problems than doing the same thing over and over. So a lot of cool potential there. Um, so back to design systems, I liked this quote, um, it's kind of the mantra of the Airbnb um, you know, design team, that a unified design language shouldn't just be a, stat a set of static rules and individual atoms, it should be an evolving ecosystem. And that's really why you need to document it digitally, because it will need um, constant maintenance and you need to give it space to constantly evolve. So we'll run through just a couple other examples just to show you what other companies are doing out there. So Google um, has a famous design system called Material Design. It's the reason so many Android applications look and feel the same. Um, they look trustworthy. So if you, I think it's materialdesign.io, and it, it documents you know, all, of, all of these Google pages that I'll kind of just run through. But here's a table of contents. So Google's looking at motion, style, layout, components, things like that. Um, they have imagery definitions. Units and measurements. Um, they don't call it atomic design, but that it's essentially, you know, conceptually what they're what they're doing, what they're documenting here. IBM, another big company, um, they have a page on their site for their living language. So another, you know, another way to say design systems. So I'll just kind of scroll through there. And again, these are all public-facing websites. You can go check them out. Uh, I came across Salesforce, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm just going to show you the table of contents. But what struck me was that the second, um, the second item in this menu is accessibility. I bet that's something that's not in anybody's printed brand materials. And it's something that's coming up on almost every project that we're on right now, some level of accessibility. And again, Vinu's going to talk a lot more about that, so I won't get into it. But consider including something like that in your design system. Um, so if this interests you, you should go to, um, you, you should check out styleguides.io. Um, I took this screenshot a couple days ago. I just went on before my talk. There's now 496 um, different co companies that have uploaded their design system here. So uh, very inspirational. You can see the Starbucks design system, um, you know, all types of companies that, that you might um, look to uh, or aspire to be like, and you can kind of see what they're doing and how they're using digital design systems. So the benefits of design systems, uh, they are going to lay the found foundation for breaking the bimodal. So um, I know, you know Kalev has talked about this. If you want to be able to, to make smaller enhancements and changes regularly, you're going to need to set a really good foundation so that those changes don't look out of, out of place. If you're going to update one page this month, another page next quarter, you, know, you need to all be kind of speaking the same language. Um, this is really important if you plan to personalize or A-B test. You know, you need to have those components. You, you don't want a user to know that you've swapped content out. Um, it's going to create consistency within your own applications and products, but more importantly, it's going to extend that consist consistency across all your channels. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. Uh, if you are going to de de develop a design system, you should include things like colors, typography, logos and icons, uh, your grid system, motion, which I've already mentioned, accessibility, uh, a component library with clearly defined usage guidelines, usability principles, and then to make your life easier, build a resource center into that. It's where people can download you know, the EPS version of your logo. It's where they can download the PowerPoint template. It'll save on some of those emails that you all get. And if you want to start, just a couple simple tips. 
Start now. You don't need to wait till your next redesign. This is something that you can and should evolve. Um, you should absolutely do this in browser. Again, that doesn't mean that you don't have a printed book, um, but, but for the digital components like motion and accessibility, you're going to want this digitally. And then you need to, this is probably the most important part, you need to commit to regular maintenance. And what I mean by that is time and money. So in order for this to always be current, you need to regularly um, revisit it. Okay, so the last of my three topics, I'm very excited about this. People at One North are probably sick of me talking about it, but it's progressive web apps. Um, hopefully you've all downloaded our progressive web app, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But before I explain what it is, I want to start with the problem that it's solving. So it's no surprise to anyone in this room that mobile traffic continues to grow. Mobile users um, are very important. It's an audience we, we definitely want to capture. Um, and 53% of them will abandon your site if it takes longer than three seconds to load. That is a problem because most sites take 19 seconds over a 3G network. So, so what do you do? What, what are your options if you want to capture um, and serve content to your mobile audience? Um, you can either go the route of a native app, or you can have a responsive website, or you can have both. Um, and these are some of the, um, the, the features that, um, that native apps have that responsive sites don't. So they can function offline, you can send push notifications, you can install them on the home screen um, to encourage regular engagement. And you get that full screen experience, right? When you hit an app, it goes full screen on your phone and you don't have the URL bar and all those um, tools at the bottom. The unfortunate part of native apps is, you know, they're not necessarily great at being indexed by search engines. Um, you, you have to enter content in multiple places. They don't work across all devices. You know, you might have to decide, are we going to just do an Android app or are we going to do an iOS app? Um, and you know, it requires somebody to go to the App Store to find it and then download it. Um, and if you want to do an update, you know, for Apple at least, you need to send the update to the App Store and then you're kind of at their mercy, you wait for them to update your app. So you know, good and bad with native apps, there's pros and cons. Same with responsive websites. So all the things that native apps can do, responsive sites can't, um, but they are indexable, there's one place to enter content, you get the idea. So wouldn't it be great if you could do both? Um, and Google has actually come up with a way to do that. And that's where progressive web apps come in. So progressive web apps um, have a couple of, you know, kind of these nine characteristics um, so that they're progressive in nature. Um, they start as a website and then they kind of just become enhanced uh, depending on the browser that your mobile users are using. They are responsive by nature. I mean, at its core, these are responsive websites that took their vitamins. You can think about it that way. They're discoverable, so somebody searches for it, um, or you can link to it. Uh, they're app-like, so I'll get into more of that in a little bit, but again, they feel like an app. They're full screen. They can do a lot of the things that you know, previously only native apps could do. They're connectivity independent. So if you're in a low connection situation or you're completely offline, that content has been cached on your um, device and it's still accessible, which is pretty cool. Um, they're linkable. I've already talked about that. Uh, for most of them, you can send push notifications. Um, I'll get to the use cases for when you can't, um, but that's a great way to promote engagement. You don't want to abuse that. Um, we all know how annoying that can be, but it's available to you. It's much easier and faster to deploy. So you have one, one code base. You're not developing a responsive website, an iOS app, and an Android app. You're developing a website. Um, and then they're installable on the home screen. So on Android devices, you actually get a prompt and then you just install it to the home screen. On iOS, you have to prompt the user, um, but then it does save just as an icon and it feels and looks like an app. Uh, so the, the whole concept of a progressive web app was introduced about a year ago at a at Google conference. So Google is the one really pushing this. And um, you know, don't get too caught up in the, the terminology, progressive web app. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a modern experience for websites. Um, so they, they are websites that act and feel like native apps. Um, so this is uh, Starbucks, you know, about two months ago they released a beta version of their PWA and you can go to it, uh, preview.starbucks.com and it renders just like a regular website and then when I go back to visit it, it loses that URL bar and it feels like an app. So just kind of a quick explanation. Uh, so think of it as just a higher bar for user experience on websites. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, there were a lot of talks about responsive web design and, you know, is your site responsive? And I think now we've kind of stopped using that term because it's table stakes, right? You, you notice if a site doesn't work on mobile, but you expect sites to work on mobile. And my hunch is that in a couple of years, we might not call sites progressive web apps, but this is just what people will come to expect from your mobile experience. 
Um, you can kind of think of it as first, you know, flying first class. Um, you're still flying, right? You're not time traveling. You haven't completely changed the paradigm. Um, but it's just a much nicer experience. All right, so now we're going to look at some cool examples. Um, all of these companies have released PWAs in the last six months. Um, we're going to look at a couple of them. We won't look at all of them. So this is a video that shows um, on the left is the Washington Post progressive web app, and on the right is their original mobile site. And it just shows how quickly the PWA um, gets to first paint and renders fully and is fully interactive. So that was 0.9 seconds versus on the right, um, we'll run that one more time, takes over three seconds for the original mobile site. And three seconds isn't bad, but 0.9 seconds is awesome. Um, and there's a lot of technical things happening behind the background that allow for that that we won't get into. Um, I actually recommend everybody download this. So this is Uber, m .uber com. So they're kind of testing the, um, the PWA version of this. I still have both installed on my phone. Uh, but I've noticed that the progressive web app for Uber is much better when I'm standing on a corner and I don't have great you know, um, connectivity. It renders a lot faster. So if you're out and about tonight, you might want to download this uh, ahead, of, ahead of the dinner. So, um, you know, it's three seconds to interactive on 2G networks. That's really awesome. And so um, when you first go to mover.com, this is the screen you see. It's very simple. And then an interesting thing happens. You get a prompt that asks you, would you like to load the map? And it explains to you that if you load the map, it's going to be slower. You, the experience is going to be slower. So if you don't care, if you don't need the map, if you just need to hail a cab or, or get somebody to take you home, you hit no and you just keep, keep working. So pretty cool. Um, West Elm launched theirs. And so this is just westelm.com. This is not a separate site, um, but they're kind of you know, testing and they're rolling it out um, for different markets um, through the rest of, of 2017. And it's been so successful, you can see some of the stats here, that um, over the, the next quarter or two, they're going to roll it out to Pottery Barn and Williams and Sonoma, the other brands in their portfolio. So if you've shopped on West Elm on your mobile site recently, you've interacted with a progressive web app. Um, Forbes is a publication that was kind of at the forefront of this, and they saw a tr you know, dramatic um, decrease in the time it took for their site to load um, from six and a half seconds to two and a half, and they were getting 20% more impressions on the PWA and seeing a six times completion rate. Um, Starbucks, I actually use this every morning. It's very cool. Um, so preview.starbucks.com, it is immensely smaller than their uh, native app. Um, I actually even prefer the design of this. So I don't know if you guys use the Starbucks app, but it's like three clicks to get to pay. And I always have kind of the stressful situation. There's a big line behind me and I'm trying to get the barcode up. So down in the bottom right from the second you land on preview.starbucks.com is the pay button. No matter where you are in the app, you just hit pay and it launches that, um, that QR, or that, uh, it's not QR code, the, the um, scanner. So very cool. Um, this is just a different way to look at the chart. This is Pinterest, so we're going to compare the size of their, the three apps that they have. So Android, um, 9.6 megabytes, iOS, enormous. Their PWA, very, very small, very, very light. Um, so there's all types of companies that are kind of, you know, starting to experiment with PWAs and the, the stats, um, you know, and engagement, um, size of the apps, they're, they're pretty impressive. So all over the world, there's different companies, you know, even though this concept has only been out there a year, um, it's really starting to pick up steam. So that all sounds great and perfect, and it is, but I have a little bit of bad news, um, which I alluded to at the beginning. So there are three technical requirements for a website to be considered a PWA, and they're listed up here. It's got to run on HTTPS, and it needs to have two things called Service Worker and Web App Manifest. I want to talk about the middle one, because this is what powers some of the really cool functions like push notifications. Um, support for Service Workers is not universal among mobile browsers. Um, Obviously, Google is pushing this, um, so it works great in Android, works in Firefox, Opera Mini. iPhone users, it's not there for us yet. So I was really disappointed when I found that out. Um, <laughs> especially because I had a whole talk about it, and we were developing one for One North. Um, and so let me kind of explain what that means. So service workers aren't available on mobile Safari. Again, these were all the nine characteristics of a progressive web app. So push notifications are not on the table until service workers are supported. Um, and then the connectivity independent and installable on home screen just don't work quite as well as they do on Android. So there's still a lot of benefits to developing a PWA, but I want to be forthright about, um, about how they are a little bit different depending on the platform. 
Um, so you might be wondering, okay, this sounds cool, but maybe I should just wait um, until iOS supports service workers. And I, don't, I really don't think you should. Um, you know, this is global. Um, this is from Gartner. And so you, you can kind of look at Android and iOS. You know, Android has about 81% market share right now. Um, iOS is a little bit lower. This might be very different from your users. You can look at your um, web analytics and, and kind of decide where that, um, where that divide is. Um, but here's one example to kind of prove my point. So AliExpress launched a PWA, and they saw a 104% increase in new users across all browsers. So that's really impressive. On iOS, even though those uh, service workers weren't available, they still saw an 82% increase. So there are a lot of benefits to a PWA, even if you can't do everything. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and now I have a little bit of good news. So some um, tech blogger wrote this article. He's pretty upset. Apple's refusal to support progressive web and to support PWAs is a detriment to the future of the web. Um, he was really pissed about it. And I started following this. And then I saw, on August 3rd, Apple put service workers into development. So, I mean, that's been a couple months. I haven't seen them come out yet. But, you know, I think the pressure is kind of mounting for Apple to start to support this. If I was Apple, I'd probably drag my feet, too. I think they'd probably generate a lot of revenue from the App Store, and this really has a potential to, um, to compete with that. So stay tuned. Follow me on Twitter. I'll be tweeting wildly about it when this uh, actually comes up. So a more accurate version of this slide that I showed earlier is that um, you know, it's fully supported in most of the major browsers, and it's hopefully coming soon in Safari. Uh, so you might be wondering, is a progressive web app right for my project? Um, so there are a couple, you know, yes. I mean, it, there's no reason to necessarily not do it, but these are the use cases when it's really beneficial. So it's ideal for apps or websites that are regularly visited. That's why that you know, installing on the home screen um, benefits when people come back regularly. And again, it's best for content that's really going to be um, heavily trafficked by mobile users. Um, it, it is a you know, responsive website, so it will work on a desktop. Uh, but you might want to invest initially in something that uh, has a heavy mobile audience. So final thoughts. Um, you know, I started this talk with that video that we all kind of laughed at about how futuristic internet and email seemed at the time. And some of this might seem like that, but I think a lot of it is closer than we might think. And you know, over the course of the next year, you guys might start to um, you know, come across topics like these. And so um, kind of as a, a proof of concept for, the, for a lot of the things I talked about today, you know, we um, at One North, we had a hackathon a couple weeks ago, and we developed our first PWA. So that's why we've you know, been kind of pushing that. It's pwa.onenorth.com. Um, it's got the schedule on it. You can ask a question if you're wondering, like, what's the dress code for tonight or, um, you know, what time does everything start tomorrow? You can use the ask a question feature. You can view the schedule. Um, go offline. There's a little Easter egg uh, picture on there. You'll know it was me by the nature of the picture. Uh, but it was really fun to develop this and to work with the team. Um, most of the developers, you know, they're not here, um, but a really dedicated team that worked on this. And so if you have questions about it, um, feel free to ask me. Tonight, I'll try to answer them, but I will call the developers if it gets too technical. Um, so finally, you know, the, the future is bright, and I'm really excited about a lot of the topics um, that I talked about today, um, and hope you are too. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.